Good morning, everyone. Welcome to La Cunada Congregational Church. We have an opportunity to worship and connect with one another throughout the week. On Mondays, we gather for a time of coffee and catching up on how life is going. Tuesdays, we'll have time of prayer. Wednesdays, we will be engaged in a Bible study centering around the concept of gratitude and gratefulness from Diana Butler Bass's book on that topic. And then on Thursdays, we'll gather in the evenings to, again, catch up and share life and fond memories with one another. I hope in these ways you find that we are remaining connected, even though we have to keep our distance. And then, of course, we are continuing to accept donations to support the work at the Friends Indeed Food Pantry, as well as Showers of Hope. And so I hope in all of these ways throughout this week, you find it as a means for you to feel connected not only to one another, but to God and the good grace that God gives us in this world. The psalmist says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is humanity that you are mindful of us, human beings that you care for us? It's amazing that within this vast creation of goodness and grace, that God puts us as pinnacles of creation, as the best representation of who God is and who God will be in this world. I pray that in this time of worship, you find yourselves formed into this image, that you find yourself welcome and called to participate in God's grace within this world. Your grace is enough. Your grace. 
I'd like to invite you to pray with me. God of goodness, we receive your grace, often without notice. Every breath we take is a gift. Each person we meet is a gift. Help us to see life in abundance around us and help us to stand against the tyrant of death who seeks to rule us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'd like to give you an opportunity to voice your specific prayers to God at this time. It's a time of reflection, a time of consideration, a time where I hope that our hearts are drawn not only to our own needs, but to the needs of people that we know around us and indeed of the world as it surrounds us. May we bear their burdens to the one who can calm and comfort to the one who can move and can save. And so let us pray. And again, let us return now together to pray the prayer that the Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Last week, as I was watching Mayor Garcetti give another update about the state of the coronavirus within the LA region, as well as the protests uh, against injustice were happening throughout the region, during the middle of this press conference, there's an earthquake. And I thought to myself, yeah, that seems about right. 2020 has not gone the way I thought, and in fact, it seems to be getting worse as we enter into it. We joke about it, how now there's murder hornets flying around, and, and the world just seems to be getting more and more intense. And I think our instinct is that if we could, we would just start the whole thing over again. That we get so frustrated with the way that things are working that we feel that we just need to tear everything down and start from scratch. And I, I think that as we look around, it feels that everything seems to be touched by this disease of death, that we are plagued with things that are so beyond our control that we just don't know what to do. And as I was reading our passage this morning in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17, Paul is dealing with a world that seems plagued by death and that where many people feel so powerless to stop it, that the question is, is, can we just start over? Is there a way to just reboot the whole system? And so I hope that as we explore this passage today, you can find hope and that we can see how Paul envisions new creation coming true for us. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned, sin was indeed in the world before the law. But sin was not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. 
And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If, because of the one's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Paul has a core theological foundation. In Christ's resurrection, new creation has happened. This is finally a chance to get right what went wrong with humanity. And so he's going to use this metaphor of Adam as the beginning of creation to then contrast what happens now in Jesus as new creation comes. And Paul sees that the reality that plagues so much of us is that we are overcome by death and sin. As we read through this passage in Romans 5, it feels as if death and sin is personified. And that makes sense knowing that Paul is writing to the church at Rome who is ruled by an emperor who seems to be singularly responsible for death and destruction in his reign. Paul will envision that death is a tyrant and that death uses sin as a constable and a high priest converting people to its ways and then oppressing them once converted. Paul is going to, to see that, that we are so wrapped up into it that it's often hard for us to distinguish other ways of being. Paul will look back at Adam and say that through the disobedience this one time that death came in and, and, and got a foothold into this world so much that our fear of death, maybe even our collusion with death, has allowed us to drive this engine of sin. That we scrape and hoard and keep and protect, we reject and oppress, we blame and we judge, and we do it all in the name of finding life for ourselves, which so often means death for others. But in Christ, something new happens. And in Christ's obedience to the ways of love and generosity, of welcome and embrace, the death is defeated. That the disobedience of Adam is overwhelmed now by the obedience of Christ. What we see in, in the way that Christ acts is resisting death. Not by becoming more violent than what death could be, not by picking up swords against the swords of death, but instead through acts of surrender. And we often think that these acts feel weak. That we've been trained to, to think that love and grace and forgiveness and hope is naive. That instead, at some point, we have to respond with violence. And instead, what we see in Jesus is that Jesus will embrace love and grace as a form of power, and not just a form of power, but a power that is able to overwhelm what death is trying to accomplish. That in Christ, we see an abundance of life offered through the means of surrender and care, of mercy. And Paul is going to use the rhetoric of this passage to contrast just how thin death really is, how singular it is in its capacity to subtract. But in Christ, we don't just have addition to counterbalance what death is up to. Paul says in Christ, there is this sense of overwhelming move against the tyranny of death, that there is now multiplication in the way that life is given to us and shared that we now have in grace a chance to overwhelm the acts of death around us. Adam becomes a stand-in for all of humanity, for the ways of creation as we once knew it before the gift of grace. And Adam's instinct is to secure life on his own terms by his own ways. And we do that too. That we find it easier to oppress other people and build our wealth off of their, their work. That we blame others before they could dare to accuse us. That we reject those who may reject us first. And that in fear of losing life, we end up colluding with death to try to hold on to it. 
that we don't see life as a gift that is merely received through the generosity of the one who bestows it upon us, but instead life is something to be claimed and secured and hoarded through finances and relationships and power. And this is the disobedience of Adam. That instead of receiving something given by the hands of God, we claim it for ourselves. But what Jesus does as humanity's new representative is to show us a new way of being, a new way where life and love is at work. And this is then a way that we return to this original creation. The new creation envisions us going back to how it should have been when we were connected to life, when we received life because it was a gift. And in the receiving of that life, this long stretch of eternity becomes ours and we find that we are connected to God through that life. And so in Christ, we find that we are restored back to the one who is the source of goodness and forgiveness and mercy and hope. But it's not just the fruits of God's character that we receive. But because life is now given in abundance to us, we are connected to others who share in this humanity with us. That the power of Christ to overwhelm the disobedience of Adam is that now all of humanity is lifted up and we can see one another as sharers of that common humanity. The common image-bearing nature where we share the handiwork of God among those who often look quite different than us, whose customs and speech, whose background, whose story has nothing to do with us. And yet we find ourselves bound together within this new creation. You know, as Paul would think about the Caesar on the throne who would rule with an iron fist, his language in this passage also seeks to challenge our imagination of how life now works within that context. Because death is the singular fascist who rules with authority through violence and threat, wielding death and sin as the means of maintaining power. But in Christ what we find is not that now Jesus is a different tyrant taking the throne and perhaps being benevolent to those who would bend the knee. Instead, what Paul says is that the rule of life is shared, is distributed, is given to us. And so we are no longer responsible to say we're not responsible, to say this is too big for us to, to, to do anything with. But because life is given to us, and not just life, but the rule of life is given to us, we are responsible for the overthrow of death. And in the power of love and grace, we receive the means by which we can stand against this oppression. How would we do that? Paul says that it's the gift of righteousness that allows us to do that. And again, that word has become so muddled over the years that we often will imagine righteousness to mean self-righteousness. That, that I'm supposed to go and explain to other people how I'm better than them because I believe in Jesus and I sing all the right songs from all the right books with all the right instrumentation in all the right places and that makes me better than you. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul says that the gift of righteousness is built into this core commitment of who we are when we are partnered with God in the activity in this world. That God moves in this world to set right what had gone wrong. And so if we can recognize the places around us that aren't how they should be, and if we can recognize the places within us that aren't how they should be, that the gift of righteousness goes about to make that right. And that is requiring us to be forgiving, gracious, patient, listening, compassionate, that we lean into the ways of Christ to see what it means to be righteous. That we find those who have been separated from the flock and we move toward them. 
We even lay down our own life, our own claims on what should be ours so that others might be rescued. And that requires a transition in how we think. So often we measure our success by how much money we have, how secure we feel, how happy we are. And if that's what success means, then we will do whatever it takes to secure that for ourselves. I was driving to work and listening to the news and after reporting on the tragic death of over 100,000 people through coronavirus, the protests that erupt from the deep injustice, of which we're only seeing symptoms of often, and the death of black men and women at the hands of racist police, that the news would end by saying the Dow's up a couple hundred points. I thought to myself, what world are we living in where that still matters? Where this news really only affects a few within our country and yet the other stuff is so pervasive that this tyrant of death rules not just in what's going on with everyone, but it's even corrupted the hearts of the few who care if their stock portfolio has managed to go up or down today. What we need is a complete reimagination of what life looks like. And we have been so plagued by this tyrant of death that that is hard work for us to do. We wish we could go back to the beginning of the year and just reboot the whole thing. In Christ, we have the ability to go back to the beginning of everything and rethink what it means to reconsider. Maybe we're not doing it the way it should be. Righteousness is going to draw us to the place where death and sin and division claims its rule. But we know it's not true. They just haven't gotten the news yet. And so instead, what we are called to do is to be the heralds of grace, the ones who would come and share the good news to say that the tyrant has been overthrown, that its power has been emptied in Jesus' death and resurrection. And therefore, all of its claims against us, the way it would wield sin against us. Instead, we have an opportunity to change our imagination and to start reimagining a world built on love and forgiveness and grace and welcome. And I know that sounds naive and foolish, but I'm convinced that that's the only way we're going to get through this year. And so what I hope is that as we consider what Jesus has done in new creation, that this is a fresh start. And it is a, indeed a, a fresh start under the nose of the emperor. And this little, little church in Rome, through small acts of grace and kindness, did its best to make a difference. And I think that's up to all of us to respond in whatever way we can, to reject the claim that death and sin would have over us and instead say that we are sharers in the rule of life. And the means that that sees truth and power comes from grace and love and hope. That is something we have right now. We don't wait for it because righteousness compels us to move toward it. So I hope that you have an opportunity to make some moves this week to resist the call of death, to embrace the way of life given to us in new creation through Christ. Amen. I 
chose to move away. He loved me when hope had taken wing. He loved me when I lost everything. He bought me redemption's work. Jesus Christ, his son. Who shall separate me from the love of God? Shall dreams of tomorrow
The victory that is won in Christ is a victory of righteousness, of forgiveness, of seeing how the world, though broken and ruled by death and sin, can indeed be saved and restored, and that goodness and grace, that love and mercy and peace can abound. This is the God we serve, the one who freely gives life to all so that we might share in that reign. And so I pray that you have an opportunity this week to extend the good news of how God's love can transform the world around us. That in the way you act and speak, the way you love and forgive, you show that yes indeed, life is here. A new creation in love is for us. Amen.